a lot of countries want to join BRICS, the hippest club in town for now. Just recently, we heard that Malaysia has officially applied, but how exactly do you become a BRICS member? You see, there are many types of these international or intergovernmental organizations. Um, some are highly formalized, like the UN, the EU, or NATO, which have one or several international treaties as their backbones. For the UN, that's of obviously the UN Charter, for the EU it's the Lisbon Treaty, and for NATO that's the North Atlantic Treaty of 1949. These organizations also have permanent structures like the General Assembly and Security Council for the UN. For the EU, the European Council, the Commission and the Parliament are its central organs, and NATO has the North Atlantic Council, together with a secretariat in that spaceship thing in Brussels. All of these organs have defined jobs to do and wield certain powers inside the organization. Then, on the other hand, there are organizations that are much less formalized. A good example is the G7, which has no international treaty behind it, nor permanent structures. The G7 is just a name for a club of countries that meets regularly on summit level, meaning that the heads of states are meeting, or they can also meet on ministerial level or on lower levels even, where they try to coordinate policies and work on joint issues. But they do that without a legally binding treaty that would need to be ratified by their parliament and without permanent structures or headquarters. BRICS, until now, uh, is the same type of international organization, a very informal one. There is no BRICS treaty, at least not yet, and it's actually unlikely that the bloc will ever create one since they are not planning on becoming a counter-NATO or counter-EU or something of that sort. Um, there is also no headquarter or secretariat. The responsibility for keeping things together actually rests with all member states, especially with the one holding the presidency, which rotates every year among them. However, that does not mean that there are no rules. Usually what happens in these organizations uh, is that they start creating documents that they circulate and, the, and that then rely on all members being fine with them. Um, that's why BRICS, like the G7, functions on the principle of unanimity. All member states need to be okay with what is happening or at least not oppose it. Otherwise, they just won't participate in what's being discussed. Especially when it comes to membership, this is quite crucial. You might remember that there was a moment when the G7 actually became the G8, when they also included Russia. But then after, the, uh, after what happened in Crimea in 2014, the Russia got kicked out um, simply by not being invited anymore. Informal international organizations really function more like a school clique rather than a school club. However, when these cliques are successful in moving things around, there is also an inevitable need for at least some degree of formalization. This is why the idea of BRICS was actually introduced to the world not by any of the current members, but by Jim O'Neill. Back in 2001, the then chairman of Goldman Sachs, O'Neill simply argued in a paper that the GDP growth of the four original BRIC states, Brazil, Russia, India and China, were surpassing that of the G7 and hence the BRIC were a force to look out for in the near future. The actual four states simply picked up on that idea and met a first time officially on the summit level in 2009 in Russia to discuss economic matters. BRICS was then later expanded to include South Africa and uh, last year during the Johannesburg summit the leaders adopted a formal catalogue of how further states can join. Uh, which lays this rather simple process out as follows. Uh, let's have a look at this right here. I've prepared that document that clearly reads, uh, spells it out and in, in like very simple, just a few pages actually. Uh, the BRICS membership expansion, guiding principles, standards, criteria and procedures. And just on a side note, I find it interesting how uh, many of these documents, which can be, you know, very important in international diplomacy, are all made with the same Microsoft Word, or um, probably this is Microsoft Word, the, the layout and everything looks very much like it. And this then, you know, becomes a cornerstone. It's just, just a side note, because I find, find it interesting that everybody, including uh, the great powers of the world, all basically still use the same same tools when it comes to creating uh, creating uh, agreements among them. 
Anyhow, so what this lays out is first the uh, what what BRICS is um, and what the the purpose of this document is. Then, interestingly, it goes into these um, guiding principles of the BRICS. So first, like in a, a few short bullet points, right? Let's affirm what BRICS is about. Um, I just highlighted a few here um, that they want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with BRICS. Um, the BRICS participate of full consultation and promoting concrete cooperation based on consensus. So this is important. Um, there needs to be a consensus. This is, of course, much easier to achieve when you are a few countries. And the more countries you become, the, the more difficult this will be. This is something that I'm that will, that is must be very clear to everybody in the club. So need, you need to be careful with who you accept as a as a member and who not. Although um, what this consensus rule then usually means is that when when individual members don't don't agree, you try to make to get them to the point where they don't oppose anymore. Um, number. Another one, an important one, is that BRICS a vision of strengthening multilateralism, strengthening and reforming the multilateral system, and upholding international law. So, again, um, also this this club here clearly adheres to the, the these principles that we've seen already before. BRICS doesn't try to be a counter United Nations. It doesn't try to establish new norms. It simply tries to lead. The world toward a more multilateral uh, setup, uh, and it does so through three pillars uh, enunciated here: um, three areas of cooperation. First area of cooperation is political and security cooperation. Then economic and financial cooperation, and thirdly, cultural and people-to-people -people cooperation, which is also a very classic setup. Basically, politics, economics, and culture, right, of um, of these societies with each other. Uh, quite straightforward. Uh, the, then there's another, there's another part that actually very clearly spe spells out that the basic principles um, that, the BRIC, that BRICS moves by is the Charter of the United Nations as an indispensable cornerstone of multilateralism. So again, BRICS doesn't try to work against the UN, it tries to work with it and tries to strengthen the basic ideas of the UN. At least that's what the five original BRIC states have decided what the club, the clique, should be about. A, then also that there's a more significant role for emerging and developing countries that BRICS strives toward. So it is clearly meant as a counterweight to the G7, although the G7 is in here is not mentioned. Of course not. Uh, you never mentioned the rival. Uh, although I do not think that BRICS looks at the world in black and white, in, uh, in foes and friends, but you know, if you have to position yourself in the international game, you would position yourself in contrast to the G7, uh, if anything at all. But not in contrast, not against the UN, not against, um, especially not against the World Trade Organization, which it, uh, in another place, says very uh, outwardly, you know, the, the BRICS wants to work with the international organizations that are already around, uh, especially the ones that are uh, that are based on international norms, well-accepted international norms. So they are not at all norm breakers. They are norm enhancers so far. Then this is the interesting part. Standards and criteria for BRICS membership expansion in kind of funny, fancy cursive. <laughs> I, find, I find this document interesting, the, the layout of it, you know. Uh, treaties um, that are highly formalized then always follow a certain standard, a standard jargon and certain uh, certain uh, rules and so on. And this this just shows that BRICS is a much more creative and much more flexible and faster uh, organization that tries to just through cooperation in the same area to achieve things um, more quickly than you you could than you would be able to if you were a highly formalized uh, international legal organization. So a new BRICS member state should align with the guiding principles above that we just that we uh, just saw, um, then contribute to the strengthening of the BRICS. Um, makes sense. Be an emerging or developing country with regional and strategic global influence. So this is quite important. That this basically means that if a already developed country from uh, the West wanted to join, the, there would be some substantial discussions here on whether or not this is a 
they would fulfill this 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 um, requirement here. So it is meant the BRICS is still meant as a club of the develop of developing countries um, who are who are have who define new roles for themselves in the global uh, in global politics and global economy. Then the document says you have you have to have diplomatic and friendly relations with all existing BRICS member states. And you should not impose non-United Nations Security Council authorized sanctions on existing BRICS member states. So <laughs> this is it's, it's quite pretty. It's actually it excludes all of the Western uh, Western states that currently put sanctions on Russia. So if any one of the of the collective West countries would ever even dream of trying to join BRICS, you got to drop those uh, sanctions that are not mandated by the UN Security Council. And again, it shows just that BRICS is. Uh, if there are sanctions that the Security Council uh, says are important or okay, just like, like the ones in North Korea, then well, those are okay if your country uh, uh, levies those. But nothing else, no unilateral actions, especially not against these um, against existing BRICS members, right? So no, no sanctions on Russia if you want to join this uh, this club, and no sanctions on China, or South Africa, and so on, right? This this is this is this is quite important. So uh, the more interest there will be in BRICS, the higher the pressure on countries to actually break with the sanction systems of the West, which, which a lot, I mean, all the, glo the very few global South countries uh, levy these sanctions. Uh, Singapore is one. So if Singapore wanted to join BRICS, it would first have to drop the sanctions. Um, then it should be, it must be a member state of the United Nations. So BRICS is not open to non-member states, which again, uh, just enforces the power of the, of the UN um, because it makes uh, membership in the UN conditional. And that's not a given, you know, Switzerland only joined the UN in 2002. Um, although by now, uh, nearly every country on earth is part of it, only the ones that are not necessarily recognized as such um ha still have problems but uh, you know this is just again an enforcement of, of of the un as the central organization for international um dispute resolution and uh and discussions right global um, global global politics then you have to have strong economic standing and influence regionally as well as globally i found this very interesting because it means that smaller countries are countries that are have been suffering from, let's say, Western sanctions like current day Afghanistan, uh, that they might have the, the, this, this clause might actually exclude their membership, at least immediate membership. So the BRICS conceives itself as a, as a club of states that have a certain, a certain strength in regional politics. Uh, and economics. Um, they must have substantial trade relations with existing BRICS member states. It's also, like again, a, um, a clause that just points out that you, well, if if you are extremely poor and if you are extremely ex uh, secluded from the rest of the world, then probably BRICS is not the place for you. Uh, interestingly enough, then again, these these are obviously malleable and and um, uh, and points that can be addressed through diplomacy. Uh, support an open, transparent, inclusive, non-discriminatory and rules-based multilateral trading system as embodied in the World Trade Organization. And although here the word rules-based appears, which is uh, a collective West jargon, it is clearly a... Uh, uh, this, this clause is clearly shooting against the United States because the US is currently the one that is holding the World Trade Organization hostage by not appointing a judge to the appeals body of the World Trade Organization. The WTO currently cannot function properly because it is institutionally blocked, because the US uh, has torpedoed this dispute resolution mechanism um, since the, the very creature that the US helped to create is now at a point where it's, uh, it's also judging, it's also finding judgments against the United States and the US doesn't, it doesn't have that, so it uses the procedural organizational leverage that it has, because the WTO is actually a organization created under uh, with a treaty, right? It's a tre um, is created by treaty and has um, uh, um, procedures that then allow uh, some members to basically checkmate the organization. Uh, this is something that cannot happen to BRICS in this sense because it is not is not this formalized. So the not sending 
a judge to the appellate body of the WTO is a kind of a similar move as a filibuster in the United States. With a filibuster, you can run down the clock on a, on a bill on the floor um, of the House and thereby basically get rid of it. Um, the, and that's that's there. You need you use a procedural a procedural opening and an opportunity in order to to um, shoot against the substance of something that's being that's being uh, under that's under consideration. And here again, this is a procedural matter that the U.S. uses in order to to shoot against the substance of the WTO. And BRICS over here says no, 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 no. We want all of this. We want to be transparent, inclusive, non-discriminatory, rules based, even rules based through the WTO. So this is a pretty big, um, this is a bit, pretty big uh, uh, um, uh, affront or um, uh, challenge, challenge to the, to, the, to the US actually in this, one, in this one paragraph. Then I just want to come to the core of the issue, which is how, the, how BRICS membership expansion then works, because that's laid out in the last part. It's a basically a four-step process. Number one, um, and in, you, there needs to be an interested country, right? If a country decides that it's interested, then um, it counts as such. If then in the second step, there, th this country becomes a prospective BRICS member state, it can after that move into the third state um, as, as an invited BRICS member state. And fourthly, once the state accepts the invitation, it becomes a full BRICS member state. Um, it, the document also says that a country is considered interested when its leader in uh, when its leader or foreign minister formally communicates its interest in becoming a new BRICS member state to the BRICS chair, and the BRICS chair um, appears again and again. The BRICS chair is the is the the leader of the country that is currently holding the presidency. Again, like a presidency that that turn that that changes every year among them, and the the current the current presidency um, is the chair. And if a country expresses, if it's, if it's prime minister, minister it's, uh, or foreign minister or president, depending on the system, uh, tells that chair, look, we would like to become a BRICS member, then um, the first step has been, um, has been fulfilled. You are considered now an interested country and the BRICS will take note of that. Um, an interested country then becomes a prospective BRICS member state when Sherpas recommend it positively for consideration by BRICS foreign ministers. A Sherpa is a, a, a special, um, is, is a diplomatic uh, uh, word, a, a diplomatic jargon for somebody who's appointed to usually represent the president or prime minister of a country itself. And then the, uh, the, the Sherpas are bas basically um, direct envoys from the, the prime minister or so on, and then these sherpas they meet. So again, because we don't have a a formal a formal organ uh, as where where these where these organizations meet, what what they do is they they appoint somebody who then um, who a diplomat who goes out and discusses with um, with everybody else, and then they come back and they report to the foreign ministers, and uh, they are the organizers basically. The sherpas are the BRICS organizers on the. On the operational level that do the nitty-gritty and then bring it back to the foreign minister and uh, finally to the president in order for them to take decisions relatively quickly right um, so the share pass what this one says is that the the share if the share pass come to an agreement that this count that the country x is uh, suitable as a member then they the share pass will recommend that to the foreign minister which is quite interesting it gives the share pass these diplomats these career diplomats quite a lot of power in in organizing things right this is so the share pass are people to look out for who is being appointed because they are quite essential in this in this entire process here then BRICS leaders will decide on BRICS membership expansion on the basis of full consultation and consensus. So once the Sherpas recommend to the foreign minister, the foreign minister then recommends uh, to, the, to the president or prime minister of, of each of the member states, and then they meet, and, they, and if they all, all agree that uh, a, a membership invitation should be extended, then it will happen. Again, this means that with each new member to the club, it will or might become more difficult to add more members. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is something, this is a classic problem of, of international organization, but um, it does show that um, BRICS will move and function much 
more like ASEAN does than like as the, uh, the European Union does. And again, these are not the same kind of type of organizations, just the principles upon which they're built. Uh, BRICS is built on consensus, period. And if no consensus can be achieved, then BRICS cannot move. Um, it's quite an inclusive uh, process here, especially considering that we have BRICS members that have even still border dispute, India and China. But still, they will, they do come up with common uh, consensus on, 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 on issues that are too of interest to both of them. It's a very inclusive process, actually. Um, then a prospective BRICS member state becomes an invited BRICS member state when the BRICS chair, in today this will be Russia, announces the consensus of BRICS leaders on countries uh, to be invited to become full members of BRICS. Uh, and then the last step is when the, the invited country actually accepts an invited BRICS member state becomes a BRICS member state when its leader or foreign minister formally conveys to the BRICS chair its decision to accept the invitation for BRICS membership. So basically just notes passing, uh, passing around, right? Uh, a letter saying you're hereby invited and then uh, the invited country sends a letter saying like we hereby accept. Uh, which is a very informal process, right? There's no ratification involved. There is no treaty making involved. Uh, it's just uh, please join us and then um, appoint a Sherpa and your Sherpa then starts participating in the in the preparatory meetings and then your leaders will be uh, will be uh, invited to join the club. Uh, that's that's how this whole process uh, works. Um, very informal, very straightforward. And this then is also an explanation um, why uh, right now, a lot of countries are seeking to meet Vladimir Putin. Um, here's a good example that uh, from this wonderful um, uh, uh, substack uh, as the chair by Dick B. James, that Ma Ma uh, the, the leader of Malaysia, Anwar, is, is, um, is, wants to meet President Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Putin. In the coming in the coming weeks, uh, somewhere in, in Vladivostok, because he obviously wants to uh, to push this this uh, Malaysia's uh, bid for BRICS membership, which they already they already uh, announced that they would like to be a member, so they are already in stage two, and uh, the, the idea here then is to basically uh, get Vladimir Putin to uh, to to lobby in the BRICS for Malaysian membership, and if everybody says yes, then Vladimir Putin, then the Russians can extend an invitation. Uh, this year, as long as they are chair. So right now, a lot of people want to meet uh, with with the Russian leader because the the, the Russians are currently also the BRICS uh, president, and then this will of course change um, year by year. But it gives a lot of informal power to the to the current presidency. It gives a lot. It it emphasizes a lot the um, consensus mechanism still because again, like the presidency cannot, the chair cannot just. Uh, make decisions over the head of everybody else, but um, being on the good side of the chair is obviously something that is helpful. Uh, and that is more or less the four-stage process. Um, relatively easy, relatively straightforward of um, joining BRICS. I hope you found this helpful and I'll see you next time.